Um, and welcome, Representative Reckett. Uh, tell Thank us you. a bit about LD344. Well, <clears throat> actually, it's a little confusing because the 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 uh, number of the bill reversed since the last time, and again, maybe a little confused. Uh, basically, um, LD344 is my third attempt in my three terms in the legislature uh, to introduce a constitutional amendment to put uh, equal rights for women in the main constitution. Uh, as such, uh, the resolve that it is requires a two thirds vote by the members of the house and by the members of the Senate. And then uh, should that be achieved, then it would go to referendum of the people. So nothing is gonna be enacted based on what happens uh, right now, uh, but uh, what I hope is that the people will have a chance this fall, hopefully, uh, to cast their vote and decide whether or not they want equality based on uh, sex or gender into this state constitution. Great. And yeah, just tell us so that folks understand that process um, where this is different than a regular bill. A typical bill mm -hmm. goes to a hearing, has a work session and a vote, and that goes to the full House and Senate. But a constitutional amendment has a slightly different process that maybe folks should know right from the beginning. Tell us yes. a little bit about that. Well, basically what has to happen is that it comes in as a regular bill. It'll feel that way for a while. Uh, and it comes out of committee in the same kind of way it, uh, a regular bill does, which is if it's uh, the vote in the committee will be transmitted to the House and Senate as a whole uh, as the opinion of the committee. Uh, and then the House uh, first, because I'm in the House, it'll start in the House. Um, the House will vote first and then the Senate uh, on whether or not to um, enact this thing. And if it passes enactment, which is a majority vote, uh, but what's gonna happen then is there'll be a, another vote, um, which will require a two thirds vote because it's a constitutional amendment in order to send it out to referendum. So it's a, uh, it's a little different, uh, it takes more votes uh, than, uh, than a regular bill. And that has been the problem uh, in the first two times that I have introduced this bill. The first year uh, we lost um, that, when I say lost, we failed to achieve two thirds. I believe the first time by about six votes. Uh, this, and two years ago or three years ago when it was voted on again, uh, we failed to achieve uh, two thirds by two votes. So it's been very close um, the entire time that it's been in the, uh, in the legislature. Uh, however, there's been a, a bottleneck, frankly, um, mostly because um, Republicans have failed to vote for it. And uh, I, I, it's, I'm totally flabbergasted as to why, since the uh, ERA nationally uh, was actually introduced in Republican times uh, and supported by Republicans, but that has not been the case in Maine. Uh, in fact, I had, at one point, I had three Republican co-sponsors and right before the vote, they bailed out. So. Uh, I don't think there's been a Republican in the state house that has been in the Senate uh, who has voted for this bill. And that's the problem. Uh, as I say, last time out, the Senate reached two thirds because a couple of uh, committed and uh, brave <laughs> Republicans voted in favor, gave us a two thirds in the Senate. But um, in the house, we haven't been able to manage that. What's frustrating to me is that a lot of people, uh, it started out when I began, uh, people thought that there was already a federal equal rights amendment, which of course has never been enacted, although it's been uh, ratified by 38 states, which is the required number, but it's still awaiting certification uh, of its enactment. So the federal equal rights amendment has not been enacted. Uh, and the uh, in that context. And when I started this, there were, I think, only 35 states that had ratified. So when I began, there were not sufficient um, states in the country who had. So I felt it was really important for Maine to protect its own citizens by including it in the Maine Constitution. So that was my effort. 
a lot of people talk about the fact that, well, we have a lot of uh, protections already and uh, the Maine Human Rights Commission does this, does that. And the reality is the Maine, the Human Rights Commission is an incredibly important thing, but they're only allowed to do uh, actions that relate to employment, housing, public, public accommodation and uh, credit related cases. So there's no legal basis for them to handle anything having to do with domestic violence, violence against women, insurance and pension discrimination, or the issue of incarcerated women. And one of the problems has been that uh, in the court system, when uh, victims of domestic violence tried to exercise a civil right to sue uh, their perpetrator, uh, that was denied by upper level courts as not because the uh, protections that were reached out for were not part of the Commerce Clause. Go figure what that has to do with anything. But um, I'm not a lawyer, but the courts ruled that because the uh, discrimination uh, that happened to domestic violence victims uh, was not uh, under the Commerce Clause, it could not be uh, adjudicated. So that's a problem. I think, too, you raise such an important point about the fact that um, that it can be confusing or opaque how to make changes or move things forward under federal law. Mm -hmm. and also, we know it's harder than ever to make changes at federal law. So it's really on us at the state level to be doing everything we can for like structural equity. Mm -hmm. um, and Maine's been doing a really good job with that, trying to protect the, the, uh, the citizens here uh, because the whole federal piece uh, has been so up in the air. Uh, we've been trying to protect uh, reproductive rights for women uh, in, the, in the state of Maine, and we have done a really good job of that with the help of GER and a bunch of other folks that have been really very active on the issue. Uh, and we have managed those protections for the first time since the dreaded Hyde Amendment was passed in the 70s. The, um, uh, you know, the state provides uh, funding for very poor women who need abortions. Uh, that has nothing to do with the Equal Rights Amendment in Maine. It just has to do with what the, the laws that we passed in order to make that happen. So it's been, um, it's been a struggle. Um, it's hard for me. I've been doing this work for so long. I mean, I first was, came into the Equal Rights Amendment federally, first came into my brain in the very early 70s. Uh, and I have been advocating for its passage since I think 1972, but I lobbied in the state legislature in 1973 for Maine to be one of the states that ratified uh, the amendment. And <clears throat> we lost that year by one vote, uh, which I always blame my state senator for because he voted against it. But uh, later on, I discovered that so did Olympia Snow. Uh, and so maybe we should blame it on her. Who knows we should blame it on it was one vote uh, in the Senate that caused it not to be ratified. But ever being the stubborn soul that I am and others, uh, other feminists as well, we came right back in the next year and managed to ratify. So Maine uh, has done its part in the federal amendment, but that does us no good uh, if we cannot get all of the states counted. <coughs> right. The other thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the places where it's needed uh, the state area is needed. I think one of the things we have to do is look at uh, the whole issue of family law and whether or not there's equality in, uh, in family law uh, in Maine and or anywhere else, but uh, we would only be looking at Maine, of course, under a Maine ERA. So it's a, there's a, there's a lines drawn and I'm, I couldn't recite to you off the top of my head where those lines are with what can be done by the federal level ERA and what has to be done by the state because the federal amendment only controls the federal government and the and their subdivisions. But uh, the state ERA would cover more things that the feds don't cover because of jurisdiction. I think that's such an important point. One of the questions in the chat is like, even if the federal law moved forward, how do we make sure we have these protections under main law? And so I really appreciate that talking about it's much broader than just you know the civil rights from the main human rights act mm -hmm. yes 
and it's uh, it's really uh, it's really a problem uh, in some areas. I remember um, the big fights on the federal uh, sometimes centered around insurance discrimination, and the insurance discrimination still goes on to this day, uh, but it's mostly state controlled. Now, the the insurance discrimination that got solved was the discrimination against women in health insurance because that got solved by the Affordable Care Act. The problem is the Affordable Care Act is like everything else we're talking about, a statute and statutes come and go. <clears throat> and uh, the Affordable Care Act, as you well know, I'm sure many of you has been, uh, there's been efforts to repeal it a gazillion times and it still could happen. And if it does, then women lose the protection of equality in health insurance because that's where that, the only place where that's coming from right now. So, um, so it's really, there still is uh, insurance discrimination in auto insurance and a whole bunch of other areas uh, because uh, based on, on things like uh, the fact that women live longer, you know, blah, blah, blah. I've always thought that uh, auto insurance should be based on how many miles you drive a year, your rates, not how old you are or what sex you are. But in any case, um, that's not covered by the federal uh, ERA. Right. So let's talk about what people can expect this week. So the hearing is tomorrow. If mm -hmm. you are planning to testify, and I see this comment in the chat, like what's really, what is helpful for people to plan to emphasize either in the hearing or if they're reaching out to their legislators over the next week? Um, well, I think it's always been, uh, it's been my experience uh, watching the legislature both before I was a member and now that I am, um, <clears throat> is to see the impact that personal testimony has. When I say personal, I mean personal stories, personal uh, discussions about areas where you believe you have been discriminated against or your daughter has or someone in your bailiwick. Uh, it's the personal stories that seem to move legislators uh, more than statistical uh, recounting of the facts and figures. Uh, and I think that that's important. I mean, I'm looking forward to including in my testimony tomorrow, a testimony I just read uh, from a seven-year-old girl in Old Town uh, who uh, sent in testimony in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment. And, you know, to me, uh, it's unfortunate she can't testify in person because she has to go to school tomorrow. Uh, but uh, I think it's really important that we bring the voices of people from seven to 80 something or probably 90, I don't know, um, uh, to bear on this question because it impacts and it doesn't, doesn't just impact women. Uh, you know, there are discriminatory ways that men are impacted, I'm, cer I'm certain, but I just don't pay as much attention to them, frankly, because they don't touch my own life as much. But I know that there are men out there who feel discriminated against in a particular way that might be covered by the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I couldn't give you a list. Sure. And you mentioned that, um, you know, in previous versions of this bill, it's been really hard to get uh, minority support uh, mm -hmm. for gender equity in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. do, how do you expect that to go this year? And do we really think that there are folks who might be more persuaded this time? I hope so. Um, you know, I have to think this, there are a lot more women in the legislature, uh, but uh, and I don't know how many of the new women are Republicans. What I do know is I was very, I was a little devastated by the last debate we had on the floor of the House where every single Republican woman testified against, uh, which I was sort of bollocks by. I mean, that's uh, really uh, not a great showing in my view. Um, but I think that I've just looked, there are now, when I last looked, there were 73 people who've submitted testimony on the Equal Rights Amendment this year, and it's a day away. Last year, at the very end of all of the hearing, there were 40 people who had submitted testimony. This year, it's 73 right now. So I think that there's a lot more people engaged this year in this discussion. Uh, my strong hope is that we'll succeed and if we do, we'll be out to referendum and this groundswell of people who's come forward in the last 10 days uh, will continue to be vocal and help us ratify 
the amendment to the state constitution. That's the ultimate goal. Are there things that you think people should really um, know or do in the next week to try to move this forward? I know it's a longer process than just a week, but you know, for folks who may not follow or, the legislative process, typically there's a hearing and then about a week out, there's the committee work session and then their vote. So we have an opportunity now to influence the folks who are on that committee, and then we'll have an opportunity again to influence the full House and Senate. So what do you think the next week looks like? Well, I think the next week probably, um, I, the problem has always been to buoy up the legislators, to convince them that A, the voices they're hearing, which hopefully will all be all of ours, <laughs> Uh, are the are the critical for this debate? Uh, I don't know uh, that they've always heard a lot of people in opposition. I think the somebody is telling them that they should be opposed, and so they are. I don't know who the somebody is. I have to tell you, I really don't. Uh, and because I can't figure out why, the only people that uh, I noticed on the list of uh, testifiers that I could identify uh, was an opponent is the Catholic Church is once again testifying in opposition. Uh, and they're doing that because they think this cover, the, the amendment covers abortion. And that's, you know, it's irrelevant in Maine. Uh, abortion's already covered. So I don't see any reason to, uh, to uh, think that way, but they do. So uh, that's the uh, diocese. I don't believe that the vast majority of Catholics in the state are in tune with that. Has that, I have no idea who's going to be opposed. Um, I know that uh, in the past there have been a few others. It's always the testimony has always been overwhelmingly in favor. Right. That's why it's just can't, fascinating to me. So you've got to talk to your state legislators. And if you have a Republican representing you, you really have to talk to them. Uh, and but it's important that you talk to all of your state legislators. And if you don't want to bother them, you think it's too much, they are already in favor, all this kind of stuff. What's important is you send them a note saying, I'm really glad you're doing this uh, and voting this way. And I'll be looking forward to seeing you do that on the floor of the House or the floor of the Senate when the time comes. Right. I really, I like to express to folks like, you know, they may feel like they have to have something prepared in order to reach out to legislators, or they might feel like, um, you know, they don't know enough. And I just really want people to know that it's always okay. Any respectful communication will be heard and is okay and appropriate. Um, and so to definitely take the time to reach out. Um, in this next week, especially if you happen to have a legislator who sits on the, um, the, the committee that will be hearing this. And so that's the Judiciary Committee, right? Right. There's links right. in the chat. Um, because if those are the people who will make that first vote. And having mm -hmm. a strong first vote can really make a difference when things come out to the full, the full legislature. Right. The, I, I want to just share with you the, the two sentences that this little seven-year-old girl in Old Town wrote as I looked at her testimony today. What she says is, I think the Equal Rights Amendment is a good movement because it will help girls grow up to be treasured as much as boys. Girls and boys are equal, capital letters. It's from a seven-year-old girl named uh, Zoe from Old Town. Um, you know, and she's been apparently following the career of some of the, uh, some of the the uh, Malalia, um, who's been in the news, has decided that this is similar, you know, and she understands that one, and she understands this one, and she wants to be equal. She is, and so she wants to be equal under the law. So, you know, that, uh, you know, that kind of testimony uh, is important because it's, you know, it's out of the ordinary, uh, and you don't, uh, people don't expect to hear from seven-year-olds. So I think it's, you know, I think it's the other reason why the fact that Miss Maine is going to be testifying is important. Uh, it's a 26-year-old woman, I believe, you know, who's, uh, who's a sexual abuse survivor and who uh, wants to come forward and help uh, issues that relate to women. And I'm really thrilled that she's going to testify tomorrow. 
And I think if you saw the Bill Nimitz article, uh, post, you saw uh, some of her story. But I think it's, um, you know, it's people that uh, the legislators don't expect to hear from that can have the biggest impact. That and anybody in their own family also helps. Is there anything that you think people uh, should should particularly know or do or any place you want to point people over the next uh, few weeks or session as this bill winds its way through the process? Well, I think really it's critical that we just make our voices heard. Uh, don't let this issue just go slide under the radar. I'm happy it's come up this early in the session because I think that it uh, has given it more prominence than when all everything else is coming together all at once. So I'm happy that it's in the second week of the of the session. It's not going to be voted on until we're back together in the in the House. So the earliest that the legislature itself could vote on this, assuming the committee voters votes it out, uh, would be on the 26th of January, because that's the next time that we're going to be in session. So after that, we don't know if we're going to be in session a lot or minimally. I have no idea. So. Um, in my head, the timeline is between now and the 26th of January, when it's most important to get your voice to the legislators. Great. Well, that gives us uh, that gives us 16 days. Um, and then, as you said, this is really a constitutional amendment is a, a long process. So there are a lot of mm -hmm. stops on the way and a lot of other opportunities for people to be engaged. I know mm -hmm. us at the women's lobby, this is something we've been working on since our founding. This is it's always the right time to flag that Representative Reckett, you are one of our founders. And so um, thanks for 44 years ago being there at the beginning. Yeah. As I might add was uh, Governor Mills was, was one of the other people that was there at the founding. So um, that's also, and she's going to testify tomorrow, which I'm pleased about as is the Attorney General and the Secretary of State. So there's a lot of people testifying. I think the Dean of the Law School. So there's a lot of people who have uh, gravitas who are gonna testify, but the legislators really just wanna hear from constituents. And so they wanna hear from you more than they wanna hear from the, the people that, uh, I don't know. I don't know what they think of people who, uh, you know, people look at politicians as if we're some kind of foreign species, you know? I'm a 77 year old woman living on social security. I am not really uh, one of the hoi polloi, uh, but I think it's important that my voice gets heard. And I've managed to do that over the years, but you know, I'm sort of stubborn and mouthy. So uh, it's been a little easier for me, but I think that we have to buoy up everybody to understand that their voice matters. Uh, and the more of their voices that, that are heard, the better. Could not agree more. I'm very inspired. I see a question from Susan. Do you want to come up? There you go. There I am. Um, hi, I'm Susan Snyder. I live in Brooklyn, Maine, and I was at the last judiciary hearing and following that for Lois. Um, I called probably every Republican in the House, and I think what's important, and Lois just said this, and I think for people who want to call, who are planning on calling uh, representatives, is it's about our vote. See, they're really short-circuiting the will of the people because we know by uh, polls that um, the majority of Mainers want an Equal Rights Amendment. So I think it's important for us to remind our, our representatives that you know, let us give us the chance to make this decision. It should be ours. It shouldn't be theirs. They shouldn't be short-circuiting this process and, and basically censoring us. So I think that's really important. Um, an important thing to say when you're on the phone with, with a representative who most likely is, is thinking about voting no. That's all. Yeah, and why shouldn't our voice, why shouldn't we have a chance to vote on this? Why does it have to be only 151 people in the House and 35 in the Senate? That's only 180 some people of Maine. That's not the population of Maine. Uh, all the citizens should have a right to be heard. And who are not representative of uh, the gender breakdown in mm -hmm. Maine yet. We're, we're still not there. And as you were speaking about um, the 
Secretary of State, the Commissioner of Labor, the Governor, it really made me think how important it is to continue to work to get um, women into positions of power to be making these decisions. Yep. I see one other question. We've got a hand raised. It's me, uh, Kim Simmons. Um, and Lois, thank you so much. Obviously, you are a rock star uh, that we need. Um, I'm curious about the possibility of linking the issues around COVID um, and the kind of, you know, it's such a gendered set of consequences to having what is considered a, you know, sex neutral set of policies. And I feel like it's a, it's a time to start to try to uncode that and help people see how we're linked structurally, like the gender divisions of labor aren't all by personal choice. And, you know, women, and there's so much writing about, you know, mothers and caregivers uh, suffering so much right now, but we don't have a union. You know, there isn't that sense of collective. Um, and I feel like in some ways there's a bridge, but it's, it's hard to make, it's fast to make, like what would having the ERA do in order to create um, COVID well, response think, that took gender into consideration. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the issues is that uh, it would drive us further towards pay equity because I look at the families whose uh, women have had to leave the workforce because they've had to stay home with the kids, do homeschooling, do all that stuff. Well, why is it the women that always stay home? It's because the men are making more money and the family is sitting there going, well, you know, I hate to do this, uh, Sally, but, you know, I'm we got to take the more money. So the guy stays in the workforce and the woman has to go home. And it's going to be a long time before those women are back in the workforce because it's not going to be a snap thing. And we still have to have daycare. And we still have to have supports. We still have to have kids back in school or we're not going to get there. So uh, you're absolutely right. The, the whole issue of uh, COVID has brought a lot of things to light that uh, some of us had paid attention to before, but now we're really paying attention to it because it's so absolutely obvious what's happened to women and their uh, and in the workforce at this point. It's just terrible. Yes, and 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 that your comments about uh, you know paid leave and childcare, like until we address address the structural things that keep women out of the workforce, we need to continue mm -hmm. moving forward through all of the means that we can. Right. It's particularly important at this point to think about the, the push that uh, the women's lobby is spearheading around uh, paid family leave. I mean, I think of our own daughter, who's right now one of her children is, uh, uh, is just had a COVID test today. What happens if he's positive? She may have to come out of the workforce again. And she's been out several times. So um, I really... Um, you know, I really can't, uh, you know, I really can't stress that enough. I could have sworn I shut my phone off, but apparently I didn't. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, no, 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 it's fine. We are here at our time. So I, I want to be respectful of folks' calendars. I know that people are often back to back um, in this COVID Zoom life. But I thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, for your long commitment to this essential work. And for folks who are either watching on the Facebook live stream or who are joining us here in the Zoom, thank you all. We will round all of these things up and make sure that they're available to you and send out the recording and the resources. So thank you, have a great afternoon and I will see so many of you tomorrow at the hearing. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.